Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. Tonight, a couple of questions come up that uh, one is a discussion of afferent and efferent neural networks and feeling as opposed to doing and um, how that affects our practice. The other was a, an overview of meditation and particularly the stuff that I was teaching at uh, Kripalu earlier, I guess almost a, a year ago, holy smokes. Um, so, yes, that was a year ago. Uh, I taught a, a week long meditation course, which was sort of an overview of various types of meditation, various uh, a smorgasbord of meditation techniques. And uh, uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and how that relates to spiritual development. So uh, let's start off with the idea of efferent and efferent neural network, because this is really crucial. This is something that is at the core of Taiji Tran development. That is feeling, learning how to consciously, intentionally feel. For most of us, this the sensory motor network is a largely pre-conscious activity. That is, you don't know what's going on for the most part. You are doing stuff and feeling stuff, and for the most part, it's not registering at a conscious level. I would, in my language, it, it that is part of awareness. We are aware of all these things occurring at some level of our being, even if we're not conscious. Conscious for me is the use of the what we consider to be the conscious mind. That is, we know that we're aware. Whenever we are aware of stuff that we don't know that we're aware of, then that's happening. That's happening at a pre-conscious level. So, to me, that's a that's a useful way of thinking of that. And most of what's happening any moment of the day is happening at a pre-conscious level. So you're constantly being bombarded with sensations, with um, perceptions. There's things going on every moment of which you can consciously be aware of maybe a millionth of what's going on in any given moment. And so consequently, we have to, we're ramming all that, that life through a very narrow aperture. It's like, you know, looking through a keyhole of the world and you're kind of, you kind of get in there and you, you say little, you know, one thing at a time. Another way of thinking of it is being like in a uh, in total darkness and you've got a, a, a pen light, you know, a little purse light and you're kind of shining it around and that's the extent of your conscious mind. You're able to poke at little things and, and consciously, due to the fact that we got a memory, that we can say, okay, there was that thing over there, there's that thing over there, there's that thing, and you can kind of put these pieces together and we get, you know, the images on Plato's cave you know, one of the uh, uh, old stories about that, you know, that is, you know, the, we're seeing the reflections of the light on the wall, the shadows, and we, and our senses, we're kind of trying to, our minds are trying to figure out these shadows. But the, um, so most of what's happening there is happening at a pre-conscious level. Something very interesting happens whenever we, start to make the pre-conscious conscious. And that requires shifting out of the conscious mind. That requires shifting out of the rational mind, which is a representational mind. It's a mind that, that thinks this is not that, and it's this like this other thing. And, and it creates a, you know, uh, uh, categories of thought and the categories of, of qualities at, it organizes things and hey, we can tell a story about this. We can, if we get enough of these qualities together, again, we're like, we're shining that little light there. We get enough information together. We connect the dots and we come up with a theory about what all these things in the darkness are. 
And that's what the that's what the rational mind does, and it's that's what makes us human. And we we don't want to get rid of that. We we kind of like it. It's 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 uh, our ability to tell a story, our ability to put things together and organize the chaos of the universe into something which has meaning is what makes us humans. And I, uh, you know, I like it. But you can get stuck in the story. You can get stuck in your, the way you rationally think about things. And then everything is kind of filtered through that story, be it a theory, be it an ideology, an ism, be it a, you know, a fear, be it a whatever. So you get, you, if you get stuck in that, stuck in the story, then you're no longer in present time. You're no longer with the moment because it takes time to run anything through your nervous system and come up with a conclusion. There's, you know, and quarter to half a second, maybe, maybe more, you know, at least a quarter to half a second. So you're always kind of running things, like there's a videotape going on there. That's always a tape delay. And you're looking at how was life a quarter of a second, a half a second ago, which in most life, it, it we, we we build that into our our day to day living. We we're perfectly okay with that pace in our conversations. We don't need to be any faster than that because it takes a little time for the information to come in. We think about it. We respond, etc. Where we do notice it though is whenever we are engaged in something where a half a second is a long time. So, you know, I think in the example I gave in one of the books was like if a, if a pitcher is throwing a 95 mile an hour fastball, you don't have a half a second to, to figure out how, the, how that pitch is coming in and, and what is the best time to initiate my swing because, you know, it's over. So there you're operating at a much higher level at that point, you're you are have shifted out of the rational mode, and you are moving into a mind-body integration at that point that allows you to perceive much more than you can in your rational state. So we get there through feeling. Consciously feeling. And so going back to the, the, the initial question here is that distinguishing between the, the afferent and the efferent, the, the afferent is information coming in, efferent is going out. So then in the terms of the neural network, the efferent is the motor function of the of the nervous system. That is whatever the whatever the central nervous system says to my hand, okay, hand, raise. And it, okay, it's coming from the central nervous system going out. That is an efferent neural uh, instruction. It is an entirely different set of neurons, entirely different quality of neuron than the afferent, which is coming in. That's where, you know, Rick feels the top of his head and says, oh, huh, I'm feeling this. And then, Whenever I it comes through and comes back to my central nervous system and and all the all the guys get on board and say, oh, that's that's the top of your head, Rick. And there's hair there, and and you can feel the weight of the hand, and, and all the, the story starts to come up, and I start to get, you know, into that whole thing. And why is my hand up here? I don't know. This is I had thought for some reason. I had the thought it was a really swell idea. Put my hand on top of my head. Huh, why would I do that? And then I get into the story. Okay. When when you get into the story, you're out of present time. It's not only a good idea to get into the story, it's fun and it uh, is illuminating and creates meaning in our lives. Just don't get stuck there. And if you're looking, staring down a 95 mile an hour fastball, 
don't spend a whole lot of time in your story because it's a strike, you know, and you got three of those and you're out. So same thing with martial arts. If some if someone is throwing a punch at my face, I don't have time to think about it and say, hmm, that punch is traveling at approximately 70 miles an hour and it's crossing a, a distance of two feet. And let me see, check my my uh, eye watch here and I'll uh, compute the, the momentum of the, uh, no, too late. <laughs> So the, what I do is I feel, which then enables me to move into a super conscious state, a mind-body integration, which then awakens spirit. That integration of the whole being where whenever you move into a state of wholeness, you start to open the door to that something more. And that's where we start to mind, body, spirit integration is that is what I consider to be a super conscious state. And then we, whenever you go into that resonance, that, that wholeness, then it is my experience and it's something which I, I find corroborated in my readings. And that is you open up to energy and information that is not limited to Stuff you already have. You can you're awakened to much more coming from coming from beyond you and in a whole lot of different forms. And the farther out you go, the more woo woo you get, the you know, the, the freaker it gets, but that's cool. So uh, the uh, simple language, you got your sensory, I feel, you got your motor, I do, and consciously separating the two so that you are aware of the feeling and you're aware of the doing and that you consciously intentionally do so a lot of what we're talking about lately is you know feeling into the stillness to mobilize the chi and then to initiate another movement at that point so we actually take you know recognize that stillness for you know, as we, you know, talk, if we think about it in terms of a pendulum, no time in that turnaround, you know, the hand is going out, the hand is coming back, and, and I'm not thinking, you know, I'm not stopping it unless I am. You know, I can stop it to feel into it and say, okay, that's what the stillness feels like. Okay, now I can feel into the stillness even though it's, there's a continuous motion there. And uh, so being able to initiate movement, motor, and be able to receive information from the environment, sensory, being able to intentionally do both enables you to then get into the essence of Techie Tran. I think it's time for questions or comments or disagreements or whatever. <laughs> so, anybody? Richard. Um, I just, can I read? I've, I've just been writing something. Can I read it to you? Sure. Um, most of the time we are consciously processing our environment. This is usually adequate. If we want to uh, process faster, we have to get out of this reality into a non-rational, non-sensorial space, <clears throat> super consciousness. Gifted athletes and probably gifted physicists have unknowingly found their way into this state. How can we learn to go there? Well, I, I think non-sensorial was part of what you were saying. Yes. I, I think it's very sensorial. Okay. So I think it's it back that I think the sensorial part, the feeling part, is what is what keeps it juicy. So it keeps it keeps it going. So I wouldn't I definitely wouldn't say that. Okay. And also okay. the the rational, it's not a an either or there. You want to get 
there's both and in the superconscious state you are capable of rational thought right as well so right. it's uh so I, I want to really emphasize that it's not an either or it's a both and okay in the superconscious state you're you're basically removing the barriers to functioning at a very high level. Rick. Okay, thank you. Um, is, this, is a sign of the superconscious state when everything seems to slow down, even though everybody's going very fast? To, to my perception, everything is really slow, giving me plenty of time to do whatever I, it is I need to do. Is that one of the signs of super consciousness? I, I think it, it a sign, although it, the opposite can also be true, but the, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, you can definitely say that that is occurring some of the time in a super conscious state. Other times you may, time may speed up where, you know, it's, it, so there's, it's a, you are not, um, time is, it, you, you're standing outside of it and you're kind of moving with it, I think, is a, is a colorful way of saying it. I don't know how true that is, but it's a, a colorful way of saying you're, that you're kind of bending time and space with your mind at, whenever, you're, whenever you're in a super conscious state. When things speed up, do you speed up with them or do you, are you in normal speed when everything else is fast? Well, this is where the what else is possible <laughs> question comes in. It's like anything that you can imagine, you can do in that, in that, in that state. That's, that's where you're, you're, you're not limited by the artificial constructs of your rational mind in that state. But you want to keep track of those because you do want to come back sometime and you want to be able to relate the two. So that your ability, so there are things that I can do in my super conscious modes and certain awarenesses that I have, which have zero practical value in, in my day-to-day -day life. And when I try to talk about them to other people, they just scratch their heads and and they, you know, they're, they're not terribly interested in that because I don't have the language to, to make the jump to say, hey, this is how this can be practical. So a lot of what I'm trying to do with the Taiji Twin is use, use that as my vehicle for, for saying, hey, this is how we can actually make this fun and, and workable and, and applicable in, in various things. It's not an ultimate Truth, it is a relative truth. It is a pragmatic truth. I think uh, the various Ricks involved here probably have a different definition of what everyday life entails than uh, most I'm people sure that, who that are not Ricks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure that is true. Nick. Yeah, Rick. Um, so what, what strikes me about it is that it may be um, in terms of a... Uh, something to look for as a sign of having of, of having been there is to notice the moments of clarity yes. where it, it's like really just there isn't a lot of stuff around it it's just clearly right right there definitely definitely true there's that clarity is like oh yeah and it like so simple that things just line up and and that's when you notice synchronicities happening. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, you're, things are so clear. It's like, you know, there, there are these weird occurrences that are not even noticeable to most people, but you may break out laughing because of, you know, the, uh, you know, the, these odd coincidences that are, that are popping up in your life. And that's sort of an indication that, yeah, you're, you're in that super conscious state. <sighs> But does it, Richard? Does it become, um, does it become detached from time when you're in super conscious state? Time is, it becomes more um, subjective, shall we say? Yes. You're not looking at an object-based 
evaluation of time. Yes. Like, oh, you know, that that's that's this many minutes, you know, has passed or whatever. Yeah, I I may have shared the story with you before, but I remember the first time I I bumped into this was you know when I was a teenager and I was I was one of my early uh, uh, LSD adventures and was was kind of trying to figure out the nature of time, and so I had I had my friend like he had a second hand on his watch you know and I would I would like go into one of these subjective things which seemed to last forever and. Then I say, "What's the time now?" <laughs> and they tell me the time, eight oh five. You know, okay. And then I go into this other thing, which took like seemingly hours of subjective time. And I come back, well, "What's the time now?" He says, "You just asked that. It's eight oh five. You know, <laughs> and, and like so, time, subjective time, changed rather dramatically <laughs> because of the very quick <laughs> uh, activity that was occurring." in that whole brain coherence produced on by lysergic acid diethylamide 25. But um, kids don't try this at home. But it's a, it's something that, it, you know, it, it struck for me like, oh, that was, that was the point. It's not like time. Okay, you got your object time, your objective time, and that's what makes that real is we agree on it. We say that you know, a day is 24 hours, give or take. So, and that's cool because then we can decide whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday, you know, and that that's really cool, you know, but how I experience Tuesday and Wednesday is going to be very different from the way other people will. And I think every one of us, that's true. So it's, in, and, and, you know, the watch pot never boils is, is a, a folk wisdom way of saying it. Like, you know, if you're, you're eagerly waiting for something. It's like, are we there yet, Daddy? Are we there? You never get there, you know. <laughs> so, um, so that's that's what I, I I think about time. So, like, you have objective time, and then you get subjective time, and it will change dramatically if you're in a superconscious state. Anybody else? All good. Okay. Cool. So let's. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, meditation. And uh, particularly, uh, the question was, what was, I, what was I doing up there a year ago in, in, at Kripalu and for a week? You know, how did I, what was, uh, what was that? What I was trying to do was approach meditation uh, from a, uh, sort of like creating an, an anthology of meditation techniques and by no means comprehensive. You know, I only had a week and, and you can spend, you can spend a year on any, any one. So that uh, it was, you know, it was like a smorgasbord. You go and you taste and you say, oh, that's kind of nice and whatever. And so you, but there'd be a specific point. And what I, I guess the underlying theme that I was emphasizing there was meditation is any technique that enables you to shift out of the limits of the rational mind. And that particularly the default mode network, which is the part of the brain, which is this, we're talking about the difference between mind and brain here. And I would like to really clarify that. So I made a jump there from, from mind into brain and, and there is a correlation, but it's the two aren't the same. So the, uh, when I talk about the rational mind, that is all the processes that, that occur that produce thought, that produce a rational thought, that is uh, a symbolic thought, representational thought, where a word means something, means something. It means this other thing. A word is representational of a thing. A, the word pizza does not immediately get you a pizza. It, it just talks about it. 
And uh, so that is a representational thought. And to the extent that we get stuck in representational thought, we are captives of that very small part of our mind, okay? Our mind is much greater than that, but that very little part there, because we spend so much time working on it, particularly growing up, that it becomes the thing. My ability to think is, is, the, is the defining part of my life kind of a thing. And whenever you are moving into, you're able to move outside of that rational thought, you awaken to something more, the gap between thoughts. You start to see, oh, every, every thought has a beginning, a middle and an end and a gap before the next thought comes in. For a lot of people, there is a stream of consciousness where one thought leads to another thought, leads to another thought, leads to another thought, and there is no gap between them. And I'd say that's a lot of people feel that way. They feel like, oh no, they're just, what gap? They're just thoughts. And, they, and I have no control over my thoughts. My thoughts just happen to me. They just pop up and, and I, I can't do anything about it. But I believe that meditation is any type of technique which enables you to go into the gap between thoughts and recognize it as a thing in and of itself. Where you go to that gap and you say, oh, wow, there's no thoughts happening right now. You know, and of course, whenever you recognize that and say that, then you're having a thought, but you can also recognize that that thought had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when you do that, you start to realize that, hey, I'm not my thoughts. I'm the guy that's doing the thinking. Cool. So, and I'm also the guy that's doing the no thinking. Cool. So then any technique that helps you to get there is, I think, a valid meditation technique. And there are lots and lots of them. Um, going back to the brain part, I believe that there's a correlation between mind and brain. and that there's a part of the brain which is called the default mode network, which is, it is charged with updating your personal narrative moment by moment. And then I went to the kitchen and I went over to the refrigerator and da, 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 da. and it, it is telling the story. And you can, if you quiet your, you quiet your mind enough, you can actually hear yourself telling yourself the story of your life moment by moment, and that's what the default mode network does. It is constantly updating it, even while you're sleeping. It's constantly da, 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 it, it, it's rattling along, and they can actually see the, you know, this particular type of mental activity registering on various uh, instruments, and they, that's sort of the, the hypothesis that they're working on, and it, it, I find it's a, a useful hypothesis for what we're talking about, that, oh, there is this thing, because it seems to match not just my experience, but a lot of people, that, hey, there's this chatter going on. There's this noise. So in the brain, the, recognizing that is a very small part of the brain that is doing all that thing, but it has a very loud voice, and it keeps chattering away. So being able to say, oh, let's play at that a moment. So when I came up with this guy, you point reach with your index fingers and you notice that, oh, gap between thoughts. I can control this activity. What is doing it? It is the feeling. Going back to the, the, the topic there about afferent and efferent. Whenever I, it's not just pointing your finger, because that's a that's a that's a doing thing. It is the the doing is the motor, but there's also the feeling. So you're actually feeling that finger as you do that, and you feel the effect it has throughout your whole body mind. And then there you are. You were like, oh, you're in the present moment. And you can learn to sustain that presence 
for quite a long time. And a lot of what we're trying to do with this activity is to learn how to sustain that. So I think, Stan, you asked a question like spiritual development. How, I mean, for me, any anything that enables you to familiarize yourself with the gap between thought is a moving in the direction of expanded spiritual awareness. Okay, so the whatever your particular flavor of meditation, and there's lots of different kinds, but um, if it enables you to get to that place where you're, you are awake for a non-zero period of time, where you're in the present moment for any noticeable period, then I think that that is opening the doorway to connecting with your higher self, your spirit, your, you know, and beyond, not just limited to your spirit, but the, that connection point to something much greater. So that's my personal, that's like a real nickel version of, of what I'm, what I'm talking about there, but I think uh, I think that's that's how I would describe it. Does anybody have any uh, questions about about this so far? All good, all good. Okay, was that enough? I can I can I can go on for longer if you need to about about the different types of meditation and things like that. But that's uh. Um, I think that that synopsizes it a bit. Scott, you have something? I was just going to say I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more, but I don't want to, you know, if anybody else is interested. Anybody else? Is that more? Okay. Um, well, let's let's start with just this. You know, being able to, you know, I I and Ted, you ran through the Western Gate. I called this instant meditation because I feel that that is what it does, it takes you instantly into that gap between thoughts. And to be able to turn that into a, a more of a process, you have to be willing to do it again and do it again and do it again, you know, over and over again. And just to be able to see how how deep you want to go, how deep into that highly coherent state you want to go, because there is a, a coherent mind where they get that clarity that you guys are talking about, and but there's also a coherent brain where the brain is functioning at a much higher level of organization because it is no longer trying to pump everything through that narrow little funnel of the conscious mind. It then is opening up to a, a broader awareness, which is not limited by your ability to think conceptually about that awareness. You have something, dude? Oh, I was going to say, maybe you could mention how this applies or affects uh, getting into spiritual growth or expansion. I think that was part of what, um, you know, what, what how, how does this feed into spirit? How does this feed into spirit? Okay, um, so the um, you know in in the in the young family secret transmissions they talk about spiritual awakening coming as through the practice, and that there is no distinction between the martial and the and the spiritual, that one is body and has to do with creating more of an opportunity to live life. And the spirit part is where you're awakening to that which is greater, that which is you are opening to your resonance with what is. And the story you tell yourself about what that means 
defines your philosophical religious orientation, but at the core of it is this resonance with what is at this. And when you do that, you, uh, you create a, 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 an opportunity, a situation, a, uh, uh, you're, you create a, a state where you are available for the energy and information which cannot be expressed in language. It is ineffable. It is something beyond, but it is recognizable to you when it happens. It's like, oh, this is big. You, you go into that and there's, there is a, an uplifting that occurs. There is a, an excitement that occurs in your, your nervous system that, that you can feel like invulnerable. You can feel like you're, you're Superman. You can feel like you are, you know, uh, sent by the gods to bring the word. What you? Know, you can feel like Jesus. You can, there's all these ways of like, feeling that you get this, this sense of, oh my God, I got something here. And it's that sense of expansion to a, what I consider is you're learning to attune. At, okay, here we go. This is, I would say that as we are, we're talking about spirit, we are learning to attune to finer and finer degrees of insubstantiality. I think that would be, uh, that would be a way of describing it in the language that I've, I've established. That is where the substantial is, substantiality is, is has the qualities of fixity and, and density and insubstantiality is moves the other direction. It moves into finer and finer wavelengths of being that are, the more we can uh, identify those, more that we can get comfortable with those levels of insubstantiality would be what I would consider to be spiritual awakening. How'd that sound? <laughs> <laughs> A bit long for a t-shirt <laughs> or a bumper sticker but <laughs> but getting comfortable with the insubstantial awakens you to the spiritual side and so learning to learning to be able to do both so in the tag you know, the the martial or the physical side is is the substantial and the spiritual is the insubstantial. And being able to toggle back and forth between those two is, uh, and to do that volitionally, to be able to say, oh yeah, I think I'm gonna get, get really woo-woo right now and be able to do that, to say, mm, and be able to, the degree that you're able to to take yourself to the woo-woo place is, um, I think, a, a, a step in the direction of spiritual awakening. You know, it's not something that happens to you. It's not serendipitous. It's something that you do. And if you do it by sitting and meditating for hours, that's great. If you do it by doing Tai Chi, that's great. If you do it by dancing, that's great. Whatever. Whatever it takes to make that happen, that's that's all cool. Something you'd like to share with the class, Lynn? <laughs> um, we were just noting that Valerie liked dancing. <laughs> she burnt yeah, out. right. <laughs> uh, but we were, Nick was, when you were saying uh, finer and finer, attuning to finer and finer uh, wavelengths of being, and he said, you know, experiencing the unfamiliar, right? And then I said, is it always unfamiliar? So I guess 
is there a way in which you are getting familiar with the previously unfamiliar? Um, and that allows that toggling back and forth? I, I think you, you build platforms of, of, of comfortableness. <laughs> Comfort, yeah, that's what I was saying. Right, so you expand. There, 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 you, 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 each one of you is more comfortable with insubstantiality now than you were say a year ago. Mm -hmm. It's something that is, you know, you get comfortable with that because you go there, you know, each of us is has a practice that <coughs> enables us to go to that that place and we say, oh yeah, this is this is I recognize this place. And then you build a platform there and you say, okay, now what? What else is possible? And then you go a little deeper and you go even more substantial and you get comfortable with that because you know you can find your way back. You know you way you can find your way back to the substantial. Yeah. Can you do some sort of short meditation or qigong so that people can like feel into it? We, we, we could. Uh, actually, I would like to share with you something that I came up with this with when I was working with Maria about something and it uh, kind of off this topic, but uh, not always because it is very insubstantial. So uh, it's a different, a different flavor. And that is, you know, I've been talking about the coordinating the um, yin part of a Taiji move with the kwa, releasing the kwa, and also reaching with the elbow. And I'd just like you to, to um, try this because my experience is that uh, the elbow thing is really simple, but it's so simple that your body doesn't know how to do it. So it's, uh, uh, it requires a certain uh, limitations in order to, to know that you're doing just that and nothing else. And uh, what, what, I, what I noticed was that a lot of times they say, okay, reach with your elbow, and this is what people do. They, there's a lifting process that occurs as well, which is helpful, but it's not necessarily, uh, it's not clean, okay? So in terms of, there's an internal process that occurs with the reaching with the elbow, I figured out a way of training it that um, hopefully you, you, you guys would, would, would like. So just take your, you can do a standing or sitting, just put your, put your arm on your chest and bring your, your hand, grab your wrist with the other hand, or with your, with, yeah, with your other hand, okay? So what you're going to do is keeping your arm flat against your body, you're, you're going to, reach down with your elbow without bringing your elbow up without bringing without raising it and bring it back to back to normal back to its regular place and then reach down again and notice that that the elbow is dropping a a certain distance there right without any lifting at all and now actually do stand up i want to show you cuz this is actually kind of cool and also kind of awakens that a certain insubstantiality there. So uh, put your uh, right leg forward and we're going to coordinate this movement with the qua. So I want you, you're going to spiral down to the right with the qua, right? So you feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee and just bring this and as you reach down with the the right elbow, you spiral down and just hold there and just feel into that. What we've done here is we've created, we've done the yin part. We've introduced the yin, we've released the qua, and we've also opened up the shoulder joint as we do that so that you create that, that space there and then come back to center. 
And now you're going to go the other way. You're going to spiral down to the left. Still on your right leg. You reach down with the elbow and spiral down to the left. And just notice your internal state as you do this. Notice how clear your mind is, how integrated you feel. And just This is just that little bit of awakening that occurs by feeling into your body and opening up the quad, opening up the shoulder joint and reaching with the elbow and come back to center. Feel the ball of the left foot, your back foot, and you're gonna spiral down to the right, reach down. Actually take, do the other elbow now. So put your hand over there and use your left elbow as you spiral down to the right, reach with your left elbow and feel into that. And notice the shift in your state of mind as you do this and come back to center. And then spiral down to the left, reach with your elbow. And back to center. So this gives us, so you get that, that internal sense of what that feels like. So now we're gonna do it. And you're just going to reach with the elbow. So shift legs actually, go to your left leg now, put your left arm out there. And this time you're going to reach with the elbow, but you're not going to lift it. You're just going to reach and open that shoulder joint as you spiral down to the left. Reach with the fingers as you do that. And just feel how, uh, <laughs> how good it feels. <laughs> and go back to center. And speak, spiral down to the right and reach with the elbow, reach with the fingers and feel the energy that you're generating just by doing this. And back to center. Feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee, your back leg, and you're going to actually use your, your right arm this time. And this time you're going to reach with your, your right elbow as you spiral down to the right. So here you got your yin hand, but you're reaching with the elbow there. And back to center and spiral down to the left and reach with your right elbow. And just feel the chi that you're generating just by this simple action and back to center. And you bring your feet up parallel, your arms out in front and you're going to release, spiral down to the left, reach with the both elbows opening up the shoulder joints and back to center. Spiral down to the right. Reach with your elbows and back to center. And now just stand there and feel the potentiality of all that movement. Opening and feel into the insubstantiality of the energy that is being produced and also of the state of awareness, the insubstantiality of that awareness state. Notice how it doesn't feel the same as if you're just executing a phys physical movement. By feeling into this posture and opening up the channels for the energy to flow, you can then feel into this insubstantiality. And as you get more comfortable with that, then it opens up to greater and greater spiritual expansion, awareness, understanding. It is the understanding of the jinn, of the energies that uh, you know, the, in the classics, they talk about that as being the, the source of the spiritual awakening is understanding energy. Bring your hands down. Go 
Just feel into that neutral posture here. You're reaching with your elbows, opening the shoulder joints. Boom, boom. You're releasing the claw. And just feel the chi in your hands. Feel the chi in your feet. Feel it circulating throughout the whole body. Feel the expansiveness. Feel the connection with the earth. Feel the connection with the heavens through your through the crown. Step in. Take a deep breath. And disappear the chi and dissolve. When you do this, anytime you do this, feel yourself going into the insubstantiality, dissolving form. We got a couple minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any any questions or thoughts, Valerie. Um. Well, that was really great. <laughs> you know, so much, so much. Thank you. That was that was great. Uh, so, something that I um. I've been doing since since we started meeting on Tuesday nights and talking about and doing and practicing these things. Before I start to do any of my Taiji set, um, I always you know do the three pillars. I'm pointing and reaching with the fingers and you know everything. And if I don't engage the elbows, that's probably the wrong word. Engage the elbows, but if I don't reach with the elbows, something's missing. But as soon as I, you know, bring in the elbows, all that happens. It all falls more into place. I can even not point with my fingers as long as I'm, you know, get that elbow gin going, that flood happens. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of that. And so I know that I'm, I'm ready to go, you know, and until I get that, <laughs> then I don't move. I, I don't move until I've made sure everything is is ready and that I've got that feeling um, and then I'm good to go. And of course, you know, I go in and out of that while I'm doing my set, but at least I've got that groundwork in the very beginning to move forward with. Um, and I love it. I love it. It's taken, so we're it's talking about mobilizing the chi there. Yes. So if the chi is not mobilized, don't don't go forward. Get yeah. go back and go back and mobilize. Yes. And what yes. we're talking about here are ways to mobilize the chi very fast, very, very quickly. You can, you know, you can get in there and you can feel it now. And uh, it's stupid simple, which is really what's, you know, confounds me at times because it is. It's, it takes no great mind. It takes no, um, you know, it just takes a little bit. It takes thought and then doing. And uh, it's not terribly complicated, which, you know, is good for me because I ain't terribly complicated. You know, the easier, the better. I like simple stuff. It, uh, it frees you up to be able to create other cool stuff. Lynn. I just wanted to point out when we were only doing one arm, as soon as I connected the elbow and the and the claw, I connected to the other elbow. Like the chi went around the back and just went boom. And just like, it's like, yep, it's all one, you know. Uh, absolutely, it, yes. It was yes. super cool, yeah. And, and I was doing something with Maria today, like, you know, where I'd have her um, reach with her right elbow and then reach out her left arm and I'd push on her left arm and, you know, it, she didn't have to reach with the left elbow because it, so energized, mobilized the chi that it, the whole system was 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 fully loaded. 
yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah it, it, it connects up the whole the whole system. Andrew. Well, first, I, I really want to say, Lynn, when you sh said that and we're demonstrating it, I was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> you were super connected in that moment. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else saw it, but it was, it was no, astounding. I, 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 yeah. And um, I guess that's all. I had another thing, but it's late, so. Go ahead. Uh, I really, well, I had an insight tonight that, well, I'm an elbow lifter, been fro for a very long time. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm an elbow lifter. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm an elbow lifter. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> then today I realized it, if you think that the only reason the elbow goes up is because it's being pulled out, or, you know, you're, not, not that it's necessarily being pulled up, but that it's, uh, you know, you're feeling the elbow chi, but it, and it just, it'll go up if it's being, if, it, if you're activating the chi, but you don't have to, I don't have to lift it consciously. Anyway, I had some kind of an experience like that. Cool. Jonathan. You're on mute, Jonathan. You're on mute. Good. Can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, okay. yeah. I recommend trying it with a bowl of chips, lying on the sofa, watching TV, just feeling your elbows right from there. Just, just not doing anything. <laughs> and, I, and the cheek starts pouring in, you know? It's just. True Wu Wei. Chi or the chips pour in? Which? Yeah. <laughs> less chips. You need less chips. Yeah, more chips. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Scott. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Yes, that was those were the droids I was looking for. Oh good, good. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Okay, everybody. Oh Richard, you have something? Uh, uh, just quickly, I I've uh, I started really enjoying the feeling of filling when I seem to get it right. Now I'm starting to disappear into it. Um, nice. So I I hope that's a progression. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, it uh, that's that's where we uh, that's where we're we're going, we're going so that you can you can it's not a, a, a this, you you generate it and then you it becomes who you are, which then is that's another platform that becomes you identify so much with that that say oh good where can I go from here, and that then you go to the next place, and it's that toggling between substantial and insubstantial back and forth that enables us to be able to take it out of the purely subjective and bring it into something that can be shared and used, applied in the world. Great. Okay, thank yeah. you all so much. Okay. okay love you. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Take care.